today we are going to talk about offline application design. And it may look weird, like I work in the UI toolkit team, and what do I know about application architecture? So let's go. So this is the world map. And the, like how many of you, let's get some numbers, like how many of you develop applications that are only used in United States or in Europe? Okay, for the rest of you, I believe your applications are used all around the world. And that's actually what happened to me. So before I joined the Android team, I used to work in this company called Path, which was a mobile social network. And by the time I joined the company, they had a fairly well-known iPhone application that was pretty good. It's very interesting. They first developed the iPhone application and then developed the Android. Weird, but people do that. And... So what happened is, like, there is this great iPhone application, and they're building a new Android team. There's some application barely works. So we started working there. Of course, like, most of the focus was, like, we need to catch up with features. So we focus on features, features. We implement the custom cameras. It was a fairly complex application. And, well, we, we had the feature parity, and then the company was growing. But we didn't have the best backend. So it will go down all the time, like almost every day we will have some server-side failures. And so what happened with Pat was we had a lot of users from Indonesia, where you, it's a developing country, beautiful country. You already don't have like great network and people are on their phones all the time because there's crazy traffic. And so they use Pat. But every time Pat goes down, we will start hearing from users hey, like, I cannot post or I cannot, like, load my feed. And these reports would always come from Android users. Like, we know the servers are down. We are working on it. And Android users are complaining. And we don't receive any bug reports from IAS. And it will take, like, half an hour or so until, like, sometimes, yes, the servers were down for more than an hour. And if it did take that long, we will start hearing from IS users saying that, hey, like, I've been sharing and no one is liking my post. Is this something wrong? The weird thing is they had no idea we couldn't upload their posts. Like, they look like it's working. It's just like someone else is not seeing their posts. So the good thing is if the server is recovered, they wouldn't know about it versus the Android users were faced with a terrible user experience because they were unable to use the application. So, and then we fixed it. So today I want to talk about, like, how do you fix it and why you should do it. So it comes to, you'll say, like, the fast application is good. Like, everybody talks about this, right? Every other week there's a blog post about why you should, your application should start, like, under a second. It should be very fast and what you can do to make it start fast. But the reality is it doesn't matter. Like, how fast your application starts does not matter. What matters is how responsive your user experience is. In other words, what matters is what your user thinks how fast your application is. Because they have no idea about their numbers. They only care about when they open your application, do they see this? Like, who thinks about a loading bar when you mention responsive user experience? That's not what you want to see. What you want to see is usually something like this. If a handsome Spanish guy talking to you about some topic you want to know. So I couldn't bring that guy. He sent me. So I'll do it today. What I can say is that, okay, like, I already cache, right? I'm using this library. I use RoboSpice or whatever. Like, I, I do cache my data. And I don't make the same request again. So the next time user comes to my application, there's always content. Like, I, I already got it so There's nothing for me to learn. Turns out it's not that true. So let's look at like a very simple application. I have this news application that has articles. And so when, you, when the data comes, you cache the request and response. And then even if you don't have network, if user taps in one of the articles, you can still show the article content even if there is no network. But what happens is user leaves the application, and it is in the background, and it decides to kill it. And next time, user clicks on it again, we bring the activity from the state state, and you see this. Like, user just saw that data, they come back to the application, it's not there anymore. This is a very, very annoying user experience. And the reason this happens in your case is that you are only caching the web request, and the only time you had that information was because you made that, like, load my news request, which you never make 
when you come to the actual news article page. So you couldn't fill your in-memory cache, although you have that data in disk, you cannot access it. It's terrible, that should not happen. So, then you can say, okay, but like the, the internet is fast, you know that rarely happens, I rarely make the user wait, like our servers respond very fast, sorry for you, yours were not sl were slow, ours is not. Now we can look at some numbers, right? So this is the network types people use. In this graph, you understand like the, the purple is good, the green is great, the rest, not so much. So if you look at the, like on the left side, there's North America, on the right side, there's the Western Europe. It looks pretty good. People have decent network connections most of the time. But if you look at the Latin America there, like 55% of people use Edge. Like when was the last time you have seen Edge on your phone? Despite the, if you're using the emulator. And you can look rest of the world. Like look at this, this is the Asia, Middle East, like the Europe, uh, the Eastern Europe, these people use edge. Like you, you need to think about it. It's a very, very slow connection. You cannot be fetching data all the time. And you need to make best of the data you have. And you may also think about, well, this is the developing world. We don't really make the money out of it. You know, who cares? Well, this is another number from, uh, stats from IDC on like where are the smartphone markets are growing. And turns out, most of it is not in Northern America or Europe. So if you look at the numbers, this is the number of Northern America. It's only 10% by 2019. That's the concern. Like, you want your application to be used only by 10% of the users? Or add Europe to that, there's another 14%. It's, it's just a quarter of users will be able to use your application. Like, it's, it's growing. People in the rest of the world, in developing countries, they will be the dominant users. So if you want to be one of those dominant applications by then, you need to act today. You need to be ready for that. People, you need to grab users earlier. So I hope you're a little bit convinced. Okay, I will consider that I should you know, write my application to work offline. And then the first question is, okay, how do we do this? And obviously, we need to start by selecting an architecture, right? There's architecture. There's like plenty of talks. Even in this conference, there is like, I guess the five architecture talks because it's the important thing. And there are plenty of them. Like there's like so many architectures to choose from which one is the one that makes my application work offline. The truth is all of them and at the same time none of them. It doesn't matter which architecture you choose in terms of having an offline application. What, what the most important part is whatever architecture you choose, you need to write it like you are doing everything locally and syncing globally. This is Adam, one of my colleagues, says this thing, I love this quote, act locally, sync globally. So you, you, when you write your application, you always write it as if you are writing an offline application. So some change happens, what do you do? You save it, you save it to a persistent storage. And then you synchronize it to the network. This is like, you need to get it off that, like, hey, I make a request, okay, get the response and then display it. You need to forget about that approach. What I do is like, I have some data, I display it. And I have something else that updates that data. There's a total separate problem. There's a synchronization problem. So what I'm gonna do in this talk is I go through some examples and see like what I, what I wanna clarify what I'm talking about. And I wanna like see in these different cases what can be done so that you get to think about your application, okay, which parts I could do better. So here's, here's an application. This is the simplest case. You may have seen this one before. So I have an application. I do like comment on some photos. I hit send. And then I wait. I wait. Like I have no idea why I'm waiting. Who cares you're sending to the server? Like let me go away. I'm a user. I don't, care. I don't even know you have a server. Like I don't understand that. So what was wrong in this application? So User clicks on the send button, it goes to your view control, like you, you have a good like view model presenter or something. Like that. And then it goes to the network, you fetch the date, you tell the network this happened, network finishes, tell the view controller and you update the view. And meanwhile, you made the user wait for this, inf for this process they had no idea about. You could fix this very, very easily. I believe all of your applications are at this stage right now. Uh, so you had a model that when the view controller does something, you update the model locally, and then you tell the UI, hey, like I said, it is in the, now I have a list that says like list of comments, 
I put it there instantly, and I update the view because it's there. And then next time it's some model sends it to the network, it comes back from the network. Now you have synchronized the data, there's something to tell to the user, and then you update the view again. And so how this will look is, sorry, I'm touching there. Uh, so I type the same comment again, I hit send, and then it's a little bit gray, not sure visible in the screen, and once it finally synchronizes to the server, it becomes like, there's a like, li little feedback to the user that there's like something is up with this comment, and user learns it because the first time they send something, is always a little bit light gray, and then it turns black. And I'm sure your designers came up with something better. So let's look at another example. We fixed that part. Now there's this other, we send comments, and when I send the comment this time, it just goes perfectly, like we did. Very nice. And then what I do is like I leave the application, right? I go somewhere else, use some other application, I come back to the same page, it's empty. And then they all come back, like, why? I wasn't that screen, it's like similar to the previous news, news app, uh, example. I have seen that page, I have seen their comments there, where did they go, like what happened? Well, here's what was happening there. So we put the model there, but we didn't put, the, the, it goes to network, and this is the only time you have the data. The problem is when you re the application, you start with an empty model. How do you fix this? Super simple. You change the model with a persistent model. So you start persisting your data on disk. So when you do that, even if user leaves the application, it's always there. And then we introduce this thing called like application logic, or whatever your favorite architecture calls it. There's something else that's responsible to make the network call and keep that model up to date. And whenever it does this, it notifies, you may use an event bus, you may use Rx, it doesn't matter which technology you use, the idea is that somebody pulled the data from network, put it into the disk, and it told the rest of the application about it. And now whoever cares about that data, in this case, user was showing the, the comments view already, so you care about that data, you can update the view. And it's always the same. When something happens, user sends a new comment, now you tell the application logic, hey, like I have some new data. I think you're interested. And this guy says, okay, let me save it to disk. And when it saves it to disk, it dispatches an event. And then your view knows, oops, there's some new data. Like, this is important. The view didn't just go and add that command into your list adapter. It only told the application, hey, I have some new data. And then the application saves it to the disk and sends the event. And then this way, your view is always some sort of event driven. It knows what to listen, it knows something has happened, and it knows it should update itself. And when the application loads, like these two things are happening in parallel, the application tries to update the network while the view updates the, itself. And then when the application syncs the state, this can be like five hours later, it, it, it will sync it eventually. And then it updates the model again with the new information, and then your, it dispatches another event, and then your view updates itself. The important thing here is like this. Like, when, when you, you may think that as soon as user puts the comment, I should update the view because I want it to be fast. Because your application logic only does an operation on the disk, and if your application is properly aligned, it will actually be super fast, like you won't notice, and your, your UI is always, always driven by the model. It makes it very, very simple. So if you look at that application, now when I open the app from scratch, the data is always there because it's coming from the disk. Okay, there's this third example we will go through here where, so I'm, I'm again in the application, I'm typing, I'm very, very excited, so I, I keep sending, sending, sending messages. But after a while, did you see like all of them became visible at the same time, instead of every time I send a comment, it stopped responding. So what was happening there? Like why, it, it should be local, right? I just told it will be fast two minutes ago, and it wasn't fast. So here's what was happening. So I had this background processor queue, just for the sake of an example, I'm using a single thread. You probably have multiple threads doing your background work. And every time a work comes, it gets processed, and you get a new job. A new job comes, it gets processed, you get a new job. But what happens if you cannot consume this anymore? It's like there's a network, and the network is super slow. You are in the, like, middle of nowhere, and then the queue is blocked, you cannot read the comments from the disk, which is another background operation, 
because you cannot upload a bitmap to the server. These are two very, very unrelated tasks, so they should not be using the same resources. The main idea, the solution is very, very simple again. You have two different set of queues. This may change depending on your application, but in the, like, the least, the basic case, you need to have something for your local operations and you have, need to have something that requires a network. Then when you have this, each queue consumes its own type of jobs so that if, if your, your disk is never blocked by the network, your network is never blocked by the disk, but that doesn't happen anyway, so you don't care about it. Uh, so this time, even if that fetch bitmap job is taking a long, long time, my user is still seeing the data as soon as it's available. It's very fast. It's responsive user experience. So in that one, if you look at the type now, is everything is there. As soon as I type, the message comes, and that message comes from the disk. But it's, it's super fast. So you instantly see the data. OK, uh, so, some questions we received. So this was an example application I showed before in another conference. And one question was like, OK, but like, it's not really that clear what my weave is doing. Like, how does it control it? What's the, what part it plays? Again, this is very, like, very broad perspective, but it's what happens in your activities. So when it's created, it sets up the UI, like whatever it's going to show. When it starts, which means like, hey, like you're becoming visible, it goes and registers for all the events it cares about, and also fetches the data for the initial loading state. It always goes to the model to fetch the data. It has no idea about network. Whenever any event happens, it simply refreshes itself. So the only thing is event happen, refresh myself. Event happen, refresh myself. It's super simple. And then eventually when it is stopped, unregisters from events. So the, the key thing here is when you start, you always load the data from disk. And then you receive the events, they can be incremental updates when you stop your unregister. So that like if something happened when your activity is on the background, you don't care about it because every time you come from the background, you there fully refresh. And these are fast. So I wanted to add more examples because we, we shared, gave a similar talk in Dev Summit, we shared a sample application, and one of the issues created was like, okay, I have an e-commerce application, right? There's no way you can say, okay, I want to buy this. Yeah, sure, you bought it. And like you will synchronize it to server whenever you can. Right? <laughs> it's not really possible. It's very annoying. And even worse, like it's their prices. This money is important, so the prices change. What happens when the price change? Like you tell these groups, like I cannot sell you for that price anymore. Do you still want to buy it? That would be a terrible user experience. Uh, but there's still something you can do. The idea is like, yeah, you may not your like most important use case may not be suitable for offline usage but there's still a lot you can do. So for example, in this application, the price is not the only information you show. There's a lot of information about that product, what people commented, what are the product specs are. All of this information can be cached locally. By caching, I don't mean caching the network request, to be clear. And by caching, I mean having a real model on your local client that understands what this data is. You can let the user search. Like how many times, I, like when I buy something, I always go to the same Amazon page at least five times, right? Like you, you want to read, you, there's like multiple products you are checking about. You can let the user search. There's a good chance that they will come back to the same product page again. So why fetch the same data from the server again while you know you have the data locally? And just because you understand the data, just instead of only caching the network request, you can let them search. You can tell the user, like you can communicate this with your designers and product people to provide the best user experience. But that is that you can do something, and you should. And let's say if you go to the product page to do the actual purchase, what you can do is, okay, I'm showing you the product details, but maybe what I am not showing you the price because I don't know it yet. So when the user goes to the product page, you make a request. You make a request to the application logic. Like, can you please refresh this price for me? And then while it's being refreshing, you sort, sort of like let the user know that the data is being processed, hopefully with a better animation. When the data is available, you show it to the user. Now, it's, if you're saying that your servers are super fast, this will be instant anyways. 
And for the like 10% of the cases where it is not fa fast, it will still be a nice user experience and you are not going to block the user. Plus there's a good chance that they will back off from the page even without thinking about buying. So another example we see frequently is the messaging applications. Now messaging applications has a very good case not to do the offline work, which is it is instant, right? That message is probably not valuable after an hour. So, so if I could send it now, I send it now, otherwise, eh, I don't care. So let's look at an example here. There's Jeremy, Jenny and Michael, these are couples. So Jenny says, hey, let's go to a movie. Michael says, yes, okay, let's watch this one. And you pick me up at seven. Mike says, cool, I will pick you up at seven. Great. And then time passes, it's like 6.30, it's time for Michael to leave home, but he realizes his dog is sick. So he cannot go anymore because he doesn't want to leave his dog. So he sends a message to Jenny, hey, like, my dog is sick, how about you come over, watch a movie at home. So it's all great, unfortunately, that happens at a time where you couldn't send the message at that moment. So you did your part, you said, hey, tap to try again because I couldn't send the message. You did your work, right? Actually, unfortunately, what was happening is that Michael already left your application. He was looking for the vet's phone number. So he did not see your message. So he didn't know that you couldn't deliver that message to, the, to his girlfriend. And what ended up happening is, we go back to the conversation, this message has never been received by Jenny. And I'm going to show you something very important here. This is Jenny's heart. You broke it. Why? Why would you do that? Okay. How about we do, it, we do something better? So you know that user left your application, right? We tell your activity that it's not the visible thing anymore. So your application logic, when it dispatched, hey, I could not send this message. Your activity wasn't not visible, so it didn't even listen for the event. You have something that is a fallback event listener similar to the ordered broadcast, it's like, wow, no one handled this event and this seems important. Let me show a notification. So I can show a notification to the user and if user is not on their phone, it's going to ring. So you did your best this time. Oh, and then the Michael sees this, oh, like, okay, hey, uh, let me call her. And then she calls his girlfriend, everything works out, they're a lovely couple thanks to you. Now these are like little differences that you can easily make and it will make it like, big difference on your user experience. And given that how many applications are out there, these little changes are really, really important. Yeah, it sparkles. Okay, there's another thing. You say I have an application that's like I'm watching shows online. And of course there's like the, my favorite show somewhere. These are all things like you can catch offline. Even if I cannot watch the TV when there's no network, that doesn't mean I'm not going to use the application. So I open the application, these are my favorite shows. And once you go into this mentality of my application working offline, there's actually a lot you can do. Like in this UI, you can say, oh, I can let the user schedule an alarm because I don't need the network for that. I can just use the local features of the framework to do this. So there's actually, once you start thinking in this mentality, I'm sure you will find more and more use cases in your application and they can be your differentiators in addition to being a good responsive user experience. Okay, so we said we do everything locally and then we synchronize the data to the server. Of course, like the elephant in the room, how do you synchronize the data to the server? Because now things got a lot more complex, data has been changing. And luckily, computer scientists have been working on this problem a lot. There's something called operational transform, which is applications like Google Docs use this a lot where you can atomically change some data structures and they can be somehow synchronized on the server, put in order, and each client can get updated data. There's also conflict-free replication models, which like another diverge of these, or there are consistency models that you can investigate, see which one fits your application use case. But the reality is no one has time for that. So what we're going to do is we'll do the Pareto principle. We will do the 20% of the work, get the 80% of the benefit, and leave. It's way too complex if you want to do it properly. So up next, I'm going to show some examples. I'm not claiming that they're the best solutions, but what I'm claiming is they're very easy to do, 
and they will already provide a really, really good user experience. And if you need to go further, be my guest. So for example, let's say we, we have some list of posts and user can like a post locally. So we implemented this properly. When user likes a post, we mark it as liked and we save it to the model. Everything works great. User instantly sees that like while we are trying to synchronize it to the server. But here what happens is that I have another function that fetches your posts. And one of those like list of posts comes uh, the same post comes from another list as well. So it saves it to the model. So what happened is it was not liked on the server yet because we haven't been able to make that request. Meanwhile, the new data came from the server. We thought it was newer data. We just overwrite users' lo local information. as a terrible user experience again. We lost the value. But how can you solve this problem? There's a very super, super easy solution for this problem. You have another field that says, I like this locally, or like I, I change this data locally. And as you can notice, it's a Boolean, it's the object Boolean that can be null. So, and then when you like it, that's the field you said. You don't touch to the data that comes from the server, you have your own data on the client side. So when the feed is fetched, the local data is never overridden because the server does not know about that data. Uh, so what you do is, in your UI, you have some methods like is liked aggregated or whatever that checks if there's a local value. If there's a local value, uses that one. Otherwise, uses the one that was sent from the server. So that every change user makes local in your application are instantly visible and always prioritized. It's super simple. It's just one more field in your data. And you can use it more. Like there's a number of likes. Sure, I will, I will count it by looking at this data. This is very simple. It may not be perfect. It will go out of sync here and there, but this will work most of the time. It is super easy to do. Uh, another example is that, okay, you fetch data. You always fetch the data incremental, right? You don't really fetch the same content. Uh, so you say, give me the post since time one, two, three, and the server returns. Your server could actually return more data. It could tell you, these posts have been deleted since that time. Now, you need to do some sort of negotiation with your backend people, convince them to do this. But it makes a big difference for your users so that you can show up to that data. And so the whole idea here is that I can get incremental updates from the server. Now, you will say, OK, but like it's, it's a lot to track. We use IDs or whatever. The same request could be made very similarly. Like, I have posts from 8 to 31 and give me the new posts. And as the same response, now user, hey, between your posts from 8 to 31, look at these three are deleted. So I'll just let you know. And then you will delete them locally. Your server side probably just marked them as deleted so they know about it. It's much easier for them to return instead of tracking a timestamp. Yeah, it's like very little, little, little things that they can provide solutions. But of course, like what if you are updating your profile information? Now I have my data here, I have two different clients, and one of them changes my favorite color, the other one changes my last name. What do I do? Because I told the user both of them are good. Now, there is no perfect solution for this. This is like, there is no solution for this. But for your use case, you can come up with some solutions. So for example, here, my objects are version. They're, they're version from the server. So whenever I make a request, I send the data, hey, change their favorite color to green on top of version 10. And then the server side, then you can decide, hey, like, can I apply this diff on top of that version? Or maybe you just simply reject because the client didn't have most up-to-date data. Or you can have different fields having different versions. You can really find the perfect solution or a good solution for your use case with very little effort. So if you look at that example, the deleting post example, when you have versions, it actually gets even better. When you, get asks, when you ask for the new posts, you can send all the IDs you had locally and also their versions. This is not too much data, by the way. There's still little data to send, so it's okay to send it. And the server can say, hey, by the way, looks like the post 11 is not up to date on your client. Here is the new data. You can update the data locally send the proper recyclable notify event, and then you'll show an animation if, if your user happens to look at that data. Now you are synchronizing the, your data properly, very little effort, 
And it's like, it's completely separate. We didn't think about the UI at all. So when you look at the problem within these limits, it helps a lot. So now there's also something called uh, MECC, which is widely used by uh, data -wise. It's called multi-version concurrency control where like every, every time you access the database, your transaction has a snapshot of the database, which is used through these version numbers. You can look at it if you need real, real synchronization. I will not get into it. Uh, so we'll talk about the network. This is important. I know it's not very easy, but you should convince your backend people, if you can, that the API they provide for you should be written for your application. They should be written for your use cases. Like they have the server farms. You don't. You have a tiny little machine. So the more information you can get from the server, the better it is. And then you will do your part of making the best of that information. These are two different problems. So one important thing is you post metadata about uh, whatever information you will send. We'll see an example about that. Of course, batch your requests. Like this is this comes. I, I think everybody knows this by this time. Use job scheduler. This really, really awesome API that's going to make you a good Android citizen. And starting from, and we will like start being a lot more strict about the broadcast messages you can listen from your manifest because we don't want applications to waking start waking up for no reason. So you need you better start using job scheduler sooner or later. And so here's a, like a bad API example. So I have this user information, it has a name, it has a photo URL. So what's the problem here? You've probably seen this a lot many times. Well, the problem here is that photo URL because it does not tell you about anything in that photo unless you go and fetch the data. But your server has the photo, right? The photo is there, so they actually know about it. So they could be nice and they could send you the width and height of the photo. So what happens when you do this? Let's say you are showing it in a list of items. In Recycler View, for instance, you can set the image width and height from that aspect ratio so that your list is not going to jump around when you finally load the bitmap. It's much better user experience. You can send the palette so that the, while the user is waiting for the image to be loaded, you can have a nice default there. Even in, in PAD, we used to send a, like, a monochrome 64 by 64 version of the bitmap with the request so that we could show it it looks super blurry but the fade transition from that image to the actual image looks so good that it, it feels very fast for the user. So there is, once you start thinking about these options, there is a lot you can do. I'm sure you will find a lot more of these. So, here they are. That these are the things you should hopefully the takeaways from this talk. You need to architect for the user experience. This is very, very important. Every time you, like, who cares which architecture you use? Like, you should use. But your users do not care about it. What they care is their user experience. So always have that in mind whenever you develop some component, what does the user want here? You should have a real local model. Don't go lazy. There is like plenty of database object mapping solutions. There's companies like ground providing really good solutions. They're easy to use. They're not that hard. Just the initial part, you need to like, you need to do this once and it will be very easy. And stop thinking about request response. It's not like you make a request to the web server, get the data, and show it to the user. Forget about it. Always get the data that's locally available, show that to the user. Someone else brings the data from network or somewhere else, maybe it's a content provider that's local. Who cares? It's the other component's part. In your UI, you only load the data from the model. And decouple. It's very important. The only thing that makes this feasible is the decoupling because your components have like very limited functionality and they can do it properly. But don't overdo it. This is something I've been realizing recently in the like Android development community. People are like, hey, I have this architecture with five levels. I came up with the sixth level and I have seven. It goes up and up. Like, that's not a great thing to do. You're, you're running on a mobile device. So you should only decouple components when it makes sense, when there's a significant benefit of doing it. And act early. Well, this is maybe too late, but I paid this cost. It's very hard to pay technical debt if you have not implemented your application locally at first place. So the sooner you start doing this, it's like investment. The best day to start was yesterday. The next day is today. So 
All right, so before we close up, I would like to receive some questions, if there are. Okay, no questions. And then, lastly, know your enemy. The network is your enemy. Whenever you need to make a network request, you should be like, you need to see your ex. Don't want to be with that. Go ahead. <laughs> Uh, I, I work at Google. Yeah, so well, it depends. What they, I mean, Android comes with OK HTTP, but you can use whatever you want. We don't. No, not that I know. But I mean, we don't really recommend one over the other one. So just use whatever works for you. Uh, so network is your X, and your friend is the disk. It's very reliable, you love it, and it loves you too. Like, it's the heart for that. All right, thank you. I'll take it later. This is a question, okay. So the, okay, the question is, which synchronization technology or technique do you prefer because things like sync adapters are complex, which I agree. Uh, it, there's no real like, perfect solution for this because most of these depend on your application use case, but I highly suggest looking at the job scheduler or the GCM network manager for things that you can defer. Now, they're not really the best technology to do all of your network requests because they are designed to be lazy, like we don't want to invoke you all the time, we want to invoke you later with the rest of the applications. Uh, for, for the rest of the, there's some libraries, like I mean, I developed one of them, it's called Job Managers on GitHub. Uh, there's Android Job, there's like multiple uh, libraries that are designed to handle like every request of you. You can use one of them, but the, the main idea is you always need to think about like something that can run later on can be a sync adapter. I personally don't use it much. Uh, I find it unnecessarily complex. That's my opinion. When there's something like job scheduler, which actually sync adapters use job scheduler to run now. So you get the same things from there as well. Uh, so yeah, I mean, there's no perfect solution, but job scheduler is your friend. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so the question is like job scheduler and the GCM network manager. Well, job schedule is in the framework, it's 21. GCM network manager is only a Google library and it's not available in China. Well, there's not much we can do as Google in that sense. Uh, I will look, I, I have a look to be honest. I will look at alternatives. Like, there is like, there is these libraries which try to merge them, like they use if available, they use the job scheduler. If not available, they use the GCM network manager. If you also don't have them, they fall back to alarm manager. Like, the, you can pick one of these libraries, and if you are really focused on, let's say you're focused on China, where your application is being downloaded from some other store, like in my experience before working in those like, uh, separate app stores, they usually have similar APIs that map to G, uh, Google APIs. So there's probably another API that does the same thing very similarly, like Amazon's APIs are almost replicas of Google's APIs, so that you can easily use them. So I'm sure there are solutions out there for them, it's just not, nothing I have used. All right, thank you.